All right, so thank you so much everyone for joining us here today. My name is Jazz Keeler and I'm really happy to be helping out with Griffin Art Projects as a contract virtual programs coordinator. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish and Stolo nations. And we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. So thank you so much for joining us for this virtual book launch of 18 drawings. Uh, Gary Neal Kennedy edited by Kagan McFadden. So a huge thank you to Kagan for joining us here today. Um, and Kagan will be in conversation with Griffin's director, Lisa Baldessera. Uh, so before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to just mention that this event is presented in conjunction with Griffin Art Project's current exhibition, Now Bulletin, which is curated by David McWilliam and which features the archive collection and works of eminent Vancouver artist, Gary Neal Kennedy, who was the president of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax for 23 years. And today is actually the very last day of the exhibition. So uh, we're thrilled to be able to celebrate the closing of this wonderful project with today's talk. Uh, so before I go ahead with my introductions, I'd also just like to quickly mention that although you can see us, we can't see or hear you, but we'd like to invite you to get in touch with us through the chat option. And there's also going to be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So do feel free at any point to type your questions into the Q&A dialogue box, which is actually separate from the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, there'll also be the option to ask your questions out loud at the end of the presentation. So if that's something you'd like to do, it's always nice to hear from um, our audience members. So just indicate if you'd like to do that and we can unmute you when it comes time during the Q&A session. So this afternoon's event features Kagan McFadden, an artist, curator, and writer who has presented his work in exhibition and in print form throughout Canada and beyond for nearly 20 years. Notable curatorial projects include Yesterday Was Once Tomorrow, or A Brick is a Tool, magazines by artists in Canada during the 1990s, having premiered at Plug In ICA prior to touring to Art Techs and the Banff Centre. Since then, which looked at survival and resilience through the lens of immigration and colonization and was presented in four galleries simultaneously in Winnipeg before touring to Kamloops Art Gallery and Punctured Landscapes, a group exhibition commissioned by the Canada Council for the Arts in recognition of the country's sesquicentennial and following its Ottawa presentation at Aja Gamo Art Space was the official Canada at 150 presentation at the Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C. This past summer, a 15-year survey of Kagan's artist books and printed matter, Partners in Crime, was exhibited at Hotham Press in Vancouver. Kagan currently lives on Vancouver Island in the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, where he is executive director of the Victoria Arts Council and where he will have an exhibition of his own work at Deluge Contemporary Art next month. Through all of his efforts, Kagan has attempted to never make a point on any given subject, but rather to work with art, artists, archives, and other research to point to the topic in a long glance as opposed to the authoritarian gesture rooted in traditional curatorial practice. His imprint, As We Try and Sleep Press, was established in 2002 and remains his longest running engagement. And Kagan will be in conversation with Lisa Baldessera, um, who is Griffin Art Project's director. And Lisa has worked as an independent curator, consultant, and writer, and in curatorial roles in public art galleries in Western Canada since 1999, including senior curator at Contemporary Calgary and chief curator at the Mendel Art Gallery in Saskatoon. She was curator of the Contemporary Art at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria from 1999 to 2009, where she produced more than 50 exhibitions of local Canadian and international artists. Uh, so thank you so much to both Kagan and Lisa, and I'm now going to pass the mic over to you two. Thank you so much, Jazz. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and for coordinating today. And thank you, Kagan, so much for being here today. I'm so excited to hear about all that you've been working on and um, to get an introduction to the press, because I think it's going to be an um, introdu introduction for a lot of people to hear what you've been working on for um, almost 20 years, this press. Oh, it's really exciting. 
Um, and that, yes, as Jazz was saying, this is the last day of the exhibition. So it's really timely and really timely that you published this work. I've spent the morning looking through it as well. And it's such an elegant book, the 18 drawings book. So Great. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. And so it's also interesting to hear, just reading a little bit more about your work, that you've had such a long-standing interest in artists' books and that it's covered, that you've been straddling these areas of curatorial projects, but also poetry and writing and all of the kinds of art book practices, printmaking. Um, so I know that you've prepared a little bit today for us to look at and just do a little bit of a history um, looking at that 20, incredible 20 years. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing more. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you, Jazz, for that nice introduction. And of course, coordinating all the technical feats that are far beyond my capability. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm, I have a bit of a uh, thing prepared, a uh, bit of an essay, but it's very brief. And um, with Jazz's help, hopefully there'll be a sort of split screen where you see me talking and, and reading, but also some images of books, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but we'll give it a try. So, <laughs> okay, so As We Try and Sleep Press began with a chat book that I published of my best friend's poems using my desktop printer in the basement of my parents' house in Winnipeg when I was 21 years old. Essentially, I wanted to be a poet and I gravitated to modest poetry publications because to me, they seemed like artworks. I was studying uh, poetry and art history at the time. And since then, I've been attempting to navigate this, uh, this kind of dividing line between the two of them. So uh, the slides that are uh, circulating right now, we'll just stop with those. Um, those this is from um, a, a project I did around 2004 when I met Doug Melnick and Larry Glosson. So these two guys are like uh, the queer aunties of artist-run culture in Winnipeg. And together we devised this international ambitious mail art project that would announce the press's second chapbook. And that book is called 24 Love Poems, uh, which was my graduating project in Catherine Hunter's uh, poetry class. So I should take a second just to say really everything I've ever learned, <laughs> uh, I've learned from women. So uh, really all the professors that had an impact on my studies, all the uh, curators that I've loved, looked up to and held dear and I continue to revere, uh, some of my favorite writers and dearest friends, all women. So uh, with that said, um, I would I'd be nothing without their love and support and inspiration. However, uh, 24 Love Poems has nothing to do with women, uh, but it was the first uh, thing I published that broaches a sort of queer subjectivity. So the corresponding mail art project that we sort of just um, flipped through, um, that took place over 2004 with a poem of mine being released almost monthly. And then the poems were accompanied by drawings that Doug made sort of in response to my words. And then um, that's this layout here of all the, that first slide, um, the layout was done by Larry Glosson. And so the first sort of two that are very, very, um, the first two layouts on top there that are very easy to figure out, that's me <laughs> on my parents' uh, laptop or desktop in the basement. And then all the ones that are a little bit more graphic and kind of hard to figure out, those are Larry's. Um, and I think a lot of them were done in conversation with one another. Like I was thinking, oh, let's riff off Gary Indiana. Um, you know, let's, let's riff off Coke or Tide or whatever. So anyway, the three of us had a lot of fun doing that project. And uh, what was interesting is that uh, Doug and Larry are um, almost, uh, not quite, but almost twice as old as I am. Um, and so their network was obviously far greater than mine at the time. And so a lot of Doug's, uh, the people that we would mail these poems to, these like really heart-wrenching, you know, <laughs> poems about a queer breakup. Um, well, first they, they're, they're so surprised because uh, they thought actually that Doug and Larry were breaking up after like 30 years together. Uh, and then secondly, they were very astonished at the sort of um, uh, rawness or, or, or um, yeah, the kind of transparency in the words. So anyhow, um, 
Uh, so what we did was we produced these poems as a sort of pamphlet style and the style I completely ripped off uh, Rob McLennan, who uh, was started uh, above ground press in Ottawa in the 90s and he made uh, like his name just handing out these poems like leaflets or, or pamphlets and uh, so much so that when I started doing it someone said oh you've ripped off Rob McLennan does he know yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, we only did it for this one project. Um, and I can't really remember if I, uh, like I know we, we had all the uh, colorful paper printed at the University of Winnipeg uh, Press where I was uh, studying at the time. I don't know if I ever paid for them or if I put them on some sort of student union account, but um, this is all to say really the, the impetus for the press and how we got production out there is just by any means necessary pretty much. And um, a lot of uh, the early projects were so, underfunded that uh, you know it was kind of like beg borrow steal whatever you can just to get something produced uh, but it was kind of that was part of the fun too um, so at the end of the year we held this exhibition uh, of all the poems and we pinned them all to the wall and still kind of folded like pamphlets there's hundreds of them left over um, and then within those uh, pamphlets we had Doug's frame drawings uh, and then we invited another queer artist uh, to show along with us and uh, we'd actually produced a, a small artist book of his drawings as well. And this was really uh, the first time that I used the press as a springboard into the gallery system. And what I would later come to realize is that I was really uh, trying to tap into a general idea embodied as the parasitic approach to art history and exhibition practice. So um, as we try and sleep press really, um, it loosely functions as a revolving collective with me as the nucleus. And we'd go on to have collaborative events with the Annex Unplugged, a label for artists gallery, Ace Art Inc, One Night Stand, Martha Street Studio, and even a funny project uh, for Black Flash Magazine uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. But essentially all these are artist run initiatives. So that's really important as the way that we frame the press in vis-a-vis uh, -vis or who we work with or how we uh, operate in the world. Uh, over the following 10 years, I mostly focused on school and then developing, of course, a, a curatorial practice uh, and then contributing many, many, many essays to artist run centers across Canada. Uh, somehow, as we try and sleep continued and we published in no particular order, broadsheets, flip books, a children's tale about a rat who saved the world, a silkscreen topographic map with accompanying poetry, a series of postcards, a suicide note, a comic book, a travel log of outer space, and of course, uh, many poetry chapbooks. I often encapsulate the output of the press as exploring this overlap between literary and visual arts. In 2014, I was invited to contribute something that represented the press to an exhibition on printed matter and publishing. That show, it, it wasn't really noteworthy uh, for any kind of way, but um, the curators uh, really did make a lot of space for all the artists involved because these were all, all artists run publishing initiatives. And so there was a series of artist talks. And as part of that, Larry and I produced uh, what was called Handheld Manifesto. And so uh, this is really the closest that we ever came to a mandate for the press. And I will read it now. Handheld Manifesto, on publishing, on considering font variations, on distribution, on passing notes, on stealing the means of production and giving away the goods, on setting your own price, on boredom, on false promises, on making things happen, on making things up, on taking risks, on taking control, on losing control, on working with friends, on working at home, on intimacy, on remembering and reminding, on taking advantage of networks and meeting new people, or choosing to publish those you have yet to meet, on taking advantage of new people, on redefining expectation, on being circumspect, on being on and on, the publication as a portrait in your, the publication as a portrait in your lap, the publication as a portrait in your hand, the publication as a portrait in your bathtub, the publication reveals, the publication lies, the publication delivered. 
So that's our sort of uh, loose mandate for As We Try and Sleep Press. And uh, essentially, as I was saying, I treat As We Try and Sleep Press like an art space. So uh, where I think of who I would like to collaborate with and how that project could take shape. There aren't really any other parameters and it is very DIY, as I mentioned. We have received funding in the past, but really everything I do is so inexpensively produced. <laughs> it's really, um, that's the vibe that I like to put out with the press is that anyone could do it no matter what the budget, if there's a budget at all. So um, that same year, we had the fortune of working with my good friend, Divya Mera, and we published Pouring Water on a Drowning Man. And um, this is nice because we've got both the screen and then I'm gonna hold it up so people can get a reference of how elegant this little book is. Uh, so we, we published this book in conjunction with Divya's first solo exhibition with, Dave, uh, with Georgia Sherman Projects in Toronto. And hers is an elegant, slim volume of droodles. And droodle is a riddle wrapped in a drawing, the origins of which are an offshoot of the proliferation of racism in the West. They are so simple and so powerful, and to some I think so very confusing. I love this book. I think uh, it's the first book also that we printed in full color. Um, so, so we could stop right here and you could see um, that drawing uh, is actually titled, or I guess it's the title is the answer to the riddle. So this one is titled, Standing in the Ruins of Another Woman's Life. Um, but yeah, just I think um, in speaking kind of in context of conceptual art practices in Canada, and, uh, and how one very complex idea can be uh, distilled into a very simple presentation. Uh, Divya kind of masters that in this book for me. Okay, uh, so now I'll just um, draw your, uh, or I'll show you a few examples of other books now. Uh, again, it might seem funny because we're doing this sort of both on screen and um, I'm gonna hold them up. Uh, so this is um, Doug Melnick's Fruits. And this was apart from the poetry um, international mail art project that Doug and I did, this was our first sort of full scale publication. And it is, uh, yeah, there's like over 50 pages and it's a comic book, but it's also completely anti-narrative. And I learned so much from Doug over the years uh, from him and in particular his sort of aversion to narrative, <laughs> uh, which I think um, really, it seems lazy, but in fact, it's actually quite astute and a lot of the time uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, so Doug's um, kind of comic book, uh, it's full of these, uh, I think there's another slide for, oh yeah, that's the, the full color uh, double spread, kind of like the, you know, the centerfold, if you will. And uh, there's a little irony in there because the book is full of drawings of men engaged in all kinds of sexual acts. Um, and then the one kind of money shot, if you will, is totally devoid <laughs> of anything like that. Um, yeah, and I think there's one more of Doug's uh, in that slideshow. Yeah, so this is a very kind of lovely image, um, not too raunchy or anything of uh, two men that he, this, again, this is 2005. And so he was really thinking about Adam and Steve uh, versus Adam and Eve, and he had produced a video uh, along the same lines. And so a lot of uh, what Doug put in this book was just the scraps of everything lying around that he had been working on for the past couple of years or more. Uh, and then of course he did produce a few uh, just for the book too. Anyhow, uh, so yeah, that's Doug's. And then um, uh, after that, I did Parlor Games, uh, which is, I'm not sure if there's, oh yeah. So, oh yeah, this is nice. Uh, during the show this summer uh, with Hotam, he, uh, he did a book a day project for YouTube. If you find uh, Hotam's YouTube channel, it's not just my books, he's done uh, many, many, like I think there's over a hundred at this point. So I was very honored to have my friend Ho uh, highlight these different artist books. So um, Parlor Games, uh, I published, I, I produced and writ, wrote them when I was living in Vancouver. Um, and they're very funny uh, little uh, short poems about memory with these really janky drawings. Um, I have almost no facility as a visual artist. Um, so like this gin uh, poem, it goes, I've got a trick. First, I drink this whole bottle of gin and then you disappear. Watch. Uh, so that's sort of the real uh, tone of the book is it's, it's quite uh, harsh. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's a couple other examples of, of that. And, um, and then the last, uh, or the next slide, uh, it shows uh, that I launched this book. Um, well, first I published a couple of excerpts from it with Front Magazine, which was published by the Western Front 
kind of now defunct magazine. But um, so that was really uh, important uh, in terms of the, the kind of lineage of this project. But then at the end, uh, we I used um, a small presentation at Ace Art in Winnipeg to uh, show all the, the digital prints of these drawings with the poems. And then we launched the book that way. Uh, again, just sort of acting as that, as that kind of parasite uh, working off the gallery system. Um, and then um, I wanted to talk about Jean Randolph's uh, book. I'm not sure what the next slide is, but we can keep it on this one, I think. Oh yeah, so we'll, we'll keep it on the past one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, again, um, the whole thing with As We Try and Sleep too is it is a bit uh, tongue in cheek. Like, you know, people think, first of all, there's a very cumbersome title, which it is. Um, but it's uh, As We Try and then Ampersand Sleep. And so this idea of the ampersand, it actually bifurcates, you know, these two actions, like all we're doing is trying and resting. Uh, and there's really nothing in between. Um, and so, but then uh, the tongue in cheek is once we started to partner with other galleries or, or other presentation platforms, it was always as you try and sleep with, and then, you know, fill in the blank. So it becomes, you know, this kind of running joke anyway. <laughs> and so when we had, as we try and sleep with a label for artists, um, Jean Randolph uh, produced this beautiful little uh, votive and it, oh, <laughs> and it is, uh, it's sort of based on those kind of religious cards that you would find, you know, with a prayer on the inside for St. Sebastian or whatever. Um, and then, you know, on the back, it just says a suicide note and then her name and the press info. And uh, it's so completely small, like it's like 0.7 font or something like that. Like the whole thing, as you can see, is like two inches. Anyway, um, and it, I won't read the whole thing, but it does say falling asleep seems to me to be suicidal. All I would have to do is close my eyes and, and, and then I'm up or I'm down for it to know or experience or what the hell, how does one find words for such matters of these? This is suicidal, this longing to, 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 um, or, um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, to be able to publish uh, the work of Jean Randolph, one of Canada's most, to me, exciting and divisive uh, cultural producers and um, contributors uh, was so exciting. Uh, I was 25 years old or something like that. And, uh, and then she, she offers this very small idea of the suicide note. And then in the end, it's not even full sentences. Like it is just so perfect. And it's so artist run. Um, Okay, and then uh, we can go to the next slide. So, uh, so then in 2011, uh, I produced what was at the time the kind of most ambitious project I did. And this was really playing with the curator artist hybrid um, position. And it was called With Alec in Mind. And With Alec in Mind uh, used the story of uh, a, f a family uh, sort of tale of mine that I grew up um, witnessing first, and then of course, uh, living in the shadow of, which was the murder of my great uncle by his grandson. Um, and so I used the uh, Manitoba Art Bank uh, holdings of contemporary art uh, that was acquired in the 80s and 90s uh, to tell the story of Alex's life. And so there was over 50 artists in the show, something like 110 artworks. And then this piece, which, um, and so for the exhibition, instead of doing a proper catalog, we did an artist book with As We Try and Sleep Press. And um, the show itself was at uh, the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba in Brandon, which was about 25 minutes or 30 minutes from where Alec pretty much spent his whole life, including uh, the day he was murdered. And um, there's a huge, huge gallery. I think it's like 4,000 square feet or something like that. And uh, I was able to play uh, with this idea of how do you tell a story using artwork and it wasn't really like you didn't learn anything about the artwork going to see this show you got to see a lot of artwork that was fun but really if you were looking for a sort of snapshot of art production in manitoba during the 80s and 90s that could offer an entree uh, but the point is that this piece uh, was called never ending horizon and it was inspired by something gary neil kennedy had done in 1980 so i'll just um I'll read from the Pluralities 1980 catalog that the National Gallery of Canada <laughs> put out. <laughs> um, I just happened to be in Ottawa 
like in 2000 and um, uh, I don't know, like before the before 2011, so I'll just say 2009 or 10, and it picked up this catalog um, by coincidence. Anyway, uh, and Gary's here's Gary, and this is a piece he did for the show. So uh, Pluralities was sort of a survey show of like really hot art makers in 1980 across the country, and there's someone representing almost every uh, province. Unfortunately, at the time, they weren't really considering territories and things like that. Anyhow, um, so I'll read these two pieces, and they're quite funny. Like the whole thing um, with uh, with now Bulletin and and the research that David has done over the most recent years, but really going back for so many decades on Gary's work, uh, I think there is a kind of running line or through line about Gary's sense of humor. So uh, he offered uh, two projects and I'll explain. So the first one is called Horizons. And, it's, and it goes like this. The second floor of the National Gallery contains more or less permanent installation of paintings selected from its collection. The entire floor is divided into several smaller galleries, each of which exhibits paintings from a specific historical period. As my work for the exhibition Pluralities 1980, the positions of all the landscape paintings on the second floor are adjusted so that their horizon lines are on a line at my eye level. So, you know, he wanted to essentially rehang the whole <laughs> permanent collection. It's very funny. Uh, unfortunately, you know, after consideration by gallery administrators, the work was not accepted because the second floor space requested, quote, was additional to the space which was allocated to this exhibition. So it's, you know, this is kind of early on institutional critique for Gary, I think, you know, 1980. Um, and so what he ended up having to do then was offer a secondary piece, which was called allocations. And he says, as for, as an alternative to the rejected proposal, my work for Pluralities 1980 consists of all the space allocated to the exhibition, which by the time of the opening of the exhibition has not been allocated to other participants. To identify the work, should there be space left over, copies of this page from the exhibition's catalog are placed within the areas finally allocated to me, Gary Neal Kennedy. Um, so, you know, this is obviously um, a sort of shy reference to the Pluralities project of um, allocations. And uh, what I did is I, I didn't match it up to my own eye height for, but what I did was create a never ending horizon line using uh, paintings, uh, lithographs, other prints, photographs, drawings, all kinds of two dimensional works and um, really taking an artist's edge uh, to the curatorial approach. I butted them all up so that there's actually no space between any artworks as you can see. Um, I feel like this is something that we've seen kind of, you know, it's, I didn't invent it, um, but it was the first time that this gallery had presented this collection this way. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. Um, and just so we understand sort of how this installation fits into the artist book, I'll read, uh, instead of uh, curatorial notes on any of the artworks, what I did was actually wrote uh, 10 poems that tell the story of Alex's life. And so poem number six goes, while growing up on the farm, Alec thought the horizon would go on forever, an ever thinning line that stretched from Austin to Winnipeg, the only big city he had ever known at the time. Under the glow of the Manitoba moon, Alec would sit in the field late into the night and dream how the horizon could take him anywhere. One night during the first frost of the year, lying against a bale of hay, he strained for his chilled eyelashes to thaw and untangle so that he could see the horizon line. Growing up, he never thought of leaving. It just didn't cross his mind. Sure, he would think of places to go, places he had read about in school or heard about on the radio, but those were just thoughts. Later on, once all of his brothers and sisters moved from the homestead, he would visit them every so often, always returning down that same old road. What would he do in the city anyway? Um, and then, you know, sort of what goes unsaid with that poem is that what he would do in the city is probably survive. Um, so that was with Alec in mind uh, and kind of my first um, weird foray into working with Gary. Uh, and then after that, uh, what's next? I think it's, yes, uh, Historia. So, um, so this is a project that As We Try and Sleep uh, produced with our friend Denis Lassard in Montreal. 
And Denis is a beautiful uh, writer, uh, very sensitive archivist. Um, and I've learned a lot from him about that. Uh, and, I, and I do love when artists are able to actually sort of flex their archival muscle in a way that, um, that allows for the production of more work. So what we ended up doing was another mail art project. This time, you know, we had had it all figured out from the first time we did it um, almost 10 years earlier. And uh, what Denis had done was produce these 12 postcards with beautiful uh, little um, texts all in French. And the text actually relates to, a, it tells a story of the drawing on the front, which are always drawings of men's beards. And so sometimes it's like a flirty, you know, uh, encounter on the public transit with like a beautiful young man. Sometimes it's um, the uh, the odd beard that actually barbers learn to cut on. There's like a like you know you've seen mannequins with like long hair. There's a mannequin with a beard, and that really, of course, caught Denise's uh, attention. Um, anyway, so uh, so we were really happy to have produced this postcard project with me. And then we did a sort of folio with um, Martha Street Studio that involved like a silk screen of the whole project uh, folded up onto itself as well, because the thing with postcards is they get lost almost instantly. <laughs> and so the folio has both um, things. And I think um, there was an English translation involved as well, but we really did try to highlight the French with that. Uh, we did a project with uh, Larry Glosson. So, um, Larry uh, is predominantly a, a photo-based artist and in 2008 he had a huge exhibition in a kind of derelict uh, um, storefront in, in Winnipeg's Exchange District called Home Bodies and uh, it too actually uh, served as a sort of open archive for uh, many decades of production and then as part of that we produced um, this, this sort of like uh, folder of uh, photographs. This is like a terrible way to present this work, but it's also quite intimate, which is quite nice. So uh, if you look at it one way, um, there are all these uh, photos of Larry and Doug's life together. Their cat, pie, more pie, bathroom shot, dog. Uh, but then if you look at it the other way, uh, it's all um, stills from uh, a video of the two of them um, having sex. So uh, what I love is this sort of, um, it could be both uh, very sensitive and poetic, but then completely, uh, it could like turn you on or turn you off. Um, but it's something a little unusual. And as you noticed, it's inhabiting the, the very standard form of the family photo album. So, uh, you know, we like to also play with that, with As We Try and Sleep Press to see what exists out there and how we can kind of queer it or inhabit it in different ways. Um, yeah, and then, I hope this is going well. I don't, <laughs> it's very weird to just like talking to the void. Uh, okay, so then uh, the next very uh, nice project we did is, is called um, Remember, the old log house with the poet Michelle Elric, who uh, lives in Halifax, but she was living, we we're lucky enough to live together or live in Winnipeg at the same time, I should say. Um, and Michelle and her partner at the time, um, Peter Kralik, uh, they devised this beautiful uh, edition. So it's an edition of a hundred. And that's the other thing I haven't mentioned yet, but most of As We Try and Sleep was very limited edition. You know, a hundred kind of is usually the most. And uh, what it is, is actually found poems, or it's a poem based on found uh, writing from Michelle's uh, late grandfather, who was uh, a farmer of some sort uh, in Saskatchewan. So the topographic map, as you can see on this screen better than I'm holding it up, uh, is one side. And then uh, the way you read topography is, you know, you kind of look down on it and see where the circles wind up, if you remember grade eight <laughs> geography class the way I do. Anyway, and then with, um, <laughs> and then with uh, the, the top of the topography, you actually highlight different words and you can actually read them because it's printed backwards. So you read it through the map in the right way. It's very convoluted, uh, but it was like quite a beautiful project. And what we did was we, we launched it with um, the project called One Night Stand, which is a series, a rotating series of um, one night or, or one afternoon exhibition, platform performances, whatever, uh, facilitated by the artist Colin Zip in Winnipeg. And so that was a very funny kind of tongue in cheek title where it's as we try and sleep with Michelle Elric for a one night stand. <laughs> Lots of, you know, 
double entendres there. Uh, but what we ended up doing was actually just taking over a park in Winnipeg on a very lovely afternoon. I did something similar to what I'm doing now where I just like read some poems and um, sold a bunch of books for $5 a piece. And Michelle had this map um, produced. Uh, so that was kind of nice too, to think about a map in the middle of a park. Um, and then uh, this is such a fun project. Uh, so this is really um, flexing my archival nerd uh, muscle. Uh, and it's a project called Mondo Trasho that I produced uh, more or less in concert with Suzanne Gillis and uh, Douglas Sigurdsson. And Susie and Doug were the founders, along with another person of Plugin ICA, or it, what became Plugin ICA, but Plugin Gallery, essentially, in uh, 1972 in Winnipeg. And Plugin, if you're not familiar, is has uh, in the past um, really relished a, a reputation of being one of the most experimental, outlandish, parallel galleries throughout the 70s and 80s in Canada. They really cleaned up their act after Susie and Doug left in 1978. Uh, the gallery, that is, <laughs> cleaned up their act and um, and uh, started to do a lot more sort of stayed programming and things like that. And so much so that in 2001, they were uh, Canada's official entry into the Venice Biennial with uh, the work of George Beards Miller and, of course, Janet Cardiff, which won the, the grand prize that year. So to think of a small artist run center in Winnipeg starting in 1970, uh, and then 40 years later, this whole thing, or 30 years later, that whole thing happens. But in 1978, Susie and Doug, they really didn't like to program too far in advance. You know, I think they were getting some funding from gov like from government or whatever, but ultimately what they, uh, there was a hole in the exhibition schedule. So they said, well, instead of programming something, what we're gonna do is actually just turn the gallery into a rehearsal space for our band. They didn't really have a band. <laughs> so, they, so they decided like, well, I guess we need a band. Um, to fill this rehearsal space. And so they came up and Doug was, you know, he's a real uh, wordsmith and Doug came up with this idea, Mondo Trasho. And so what ended up happening is that over the course of like three weeks, which is kind of at the time was the state, like the length of a proper exhibition in 1978 at an artist run center, um, they did all these publicity shots. They, they, they had a bunch of rehearsals that were closed. Uh, and then, you know, leading up to one, big night and that was like the solo, the only performance that Mondo Trasho ever did. But in 30 years later, people were still talking about it. And like, you know, I was, you know, coming up through Artist Run Ranks in Winnipeg and everyone was, every once in a while you'd hear something about Mondo Trasho and it, they'd refer to it as the house band and plug-in. But again, it's like they only performed once. So how amazing is that, that like this thing, this groundswell of activity would live large in, in the uh, minds of everyone. So much so that, you know, it was this kind of urban legend at one point. All to say that <laughs> Douglas Sigurdsson went on to run Canada Council for a number of years. And when he retired in 2014, something like that, um, uh, he was cleaning up his boxes and his archive in his apartment in Ottawa. And he came across a bunch of the stuff that Susie and Doug had taken with them when they left Plug-in in 1978 and they moved to Toronto. So this was like a time capsule and part of the time capsule was over 400 pieces of material related to specifically to Mondo Trasho. There was also correspondence with their friends from General Idea, um, you know, all kinds of uh, amazing performance artists, uh, the Kipper Kids, you know, notes like that uh, were all over the place in this archive. But for me, I was trying to figure out a project uh, to put in print that, well, Mondo Trasho is really where it's at. And there's nothing that exists that actually tells the story. But again, in my sort of anti-curatorial, curatorial authority, I didn't want to write the long essay that explains everything I just explained. <laughs> so what I did is I, I commissioned a small text by Suzanne and Doug, um, and they, they titled it Band Practice, which I thought was very endearing. And in it, uh, okay, so, so what we did is we collected all the ephemera from Mato Trasho, and it includes even like, this is the, the page where Doug was trying to figure out what to call them what to call themselves. So it was like, the possibilities were Mondo Bongo, Belgian Congo, uh, uh, Mondo Arti, Mondo Blondo, you know, it goes on and on and on, but then eventually they settled on Mondo Trasho, which was a real punk ethos at the time too. And, um, and that's Suzanne on the cover. And then this is the band. And uh, Lisa, this might be interesting for you to know. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, the, the long-standing video artist, and at the time he was a performance artist, mainly working in installation, uh, Alex Pruznik. 
Uh, there's Doug Sigurdsson. Uh, there's Suzanne, I think. Uh, and then this guy, uh, some might re recognize as John Tupper. <laughs> uh, at the time was Johnny, Johnny Mondo. Anyhow, um, there's also like lyric sheets that Doug had written. Um, there's the one and only set list for the band, but there's just like tons and tons of uh, photo documentation. Uh, it just, it was like an amazing, this is like a song that they wrote and the chords, again, very punk rock, three chord progression. Um, that's Suzanne in uh, Boa and then the late Walter Lewick, um, who was a real impresario in Winnipeg's artist run culture. Um, he passed away uh, far before this magazine was launched. Anyway, uh, so it ended up being like a hundred page fanzine and I wanted it to be very floppy and glossy. Uh, and it actually is, uh, even though it looks black and white, it is published in full color, which is something that we started to explore as well uh, through As We Try and See Press. Uh, it's like, we didn't want to look too um, Xerox all the time. So this just sort of showed that, you know, when we had a little bit of money, we could really put it to good use. Uh, so uh, what was interesting about Mondo Trasho is that we launched it also um, as part of a long standing, pro or a, a really interesting project that Bill Kirby from the Center for Contemporary Canadian Art had organized called the Winnipeg Effect, where he was looking at through a the lens of a national um, organization, all the production that had come through Winnipeg, especially in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and really trying to pinpoint like what was going on there. And so uh, there was a big conference uh, in 2016 and we launched the book at that point. But uh, just around that time, um, Travis at Black Flash Magazine uh, had approached me and uh, I ended up uh, doing a proposal for the Black Flash um, uh, artist pages. So Black Flash, if you're not familiar, was a fantastic magazine probably produced out of Saskatchewan. They really do focus on photography, but in an expanded field. And so I offered essentially, uh, I worked with their designer and we did like a redux of the fanzine for the pages of Black Flash. And, um, you know, I had referenced general idea earlier. I, I keep talking about them always, but, um, you know, their idea of uh, the parasitic or the parasite as a kind of metaphor for what they do. And really, uh, Suzanne and Doug, who were far more uh, acquainted with uh, the boys of GI, they understood the, this idea from a, a personal point of view. And they really, uh, working with GI's idea, they, they sort of said, we wanted to be a band. And we knew that if we looked like a band and acted like a band, we could say that we were a band and we would be. Uh, and so that, that quote is in the, the sort of fanzine redux and then you know the picture of the band hanging out in a back alley in, in Winnipeg, uh, and then just sort of a, a smattering um, pastiche of, of the, the holdings. So anyway, so that's kind of a way too that as we try and sleep functions where we do one project, but then we try to kind of mix it up into something else or give it or give that project a, a better platform than we can offer. Um, the one thing that uh, uh, is sort of a running joke too is that there's no website for the press. There's like almost no way to find out about us. Um, our, like some of the screen captures that we're offering through this talk, they're almost all from like either Art Metropole or Printed Matter or something. So, you know, we work with our colleagues in those organizations, but, um, you know, we allow them to sort of do the heavy lifting, I guess, in terms of promotion. Um, and then the last book I want to just quickly talk about, uh, it was produced by me, but not necessarily by As We Try and Sleep Press, uh, but it is an artist book. And it's a book that was actually produced to go along with a performance that I did in 2016 at Ace Art in Winnipeg. And so it's called um, Architecture by, or after JPL. And JPL uh, is the late Jean-Pierre Lemaitre. And Jean was uh, a queer black uh, poet, uh, artist, failed architecture student, um, rabble rouser, <laughs> publisher. Uh, I first um, learned about Jean's output when I was a teenager uh, hanging around Plugin in Winnipeg. And, and Jean had actually produced what was called the Herald. And it was like um, a short lived uh, in-house magazine that acted not necessarily as a promotion for Plugin, but more as a, an encapsulation of the artist run goings on in Winnipeg. And so Jean would often off, uh, write what he called coordinatorials instead of editorials because I think he really understood his position as one that was coordinating the events rather than, you know, really offering the editorial outlook. 
Um, I think it also was a bit tongue in cheek where, you know, he probably wasn't being paid anything to do this. And it was, you know, saying like, that's um, how I need to be. But anyway, um, Jean unfortunately passed away um, in its horrific accident in Toronto in 2006. And kind of since then, I've been chasing his ghost in different ways. And he was part of a major project that I did uh, that Jazz referenced in my bio, the um, Yesterday Was Once Tomorrow, where I did look at Jean's um, line with um, the Herald through plugin. Anyway, uh, and then um, in 2016, uh, his sister had organized a 10 year sort of celebration of Jean's life, uh, the plugin hosted. And at that time, you know, I was just in attendance. I didn't say anything because I never really met the guy. But um, uh, one of his friends from university said, oh, I remember Johnny, um, he organized this coffee house for the architecture uh, students. And, uh, you know, it was like a coffee house in the 90s, so like people go up and like read poetry, play bongos or something. Anyway, uh, and Jean opened up the event by, by performing um, this piece called Architecture, where he just said the word architecture 200 times. And I thought, oh, well, that's amazing. Um, that should be a book. So, um, so I wanted to do the book, but then I thought, well, it would be kind of, uh, it would be more earnest if I um, also did the performance too. So I did the book as a sort of script for the performance. And then what I ended up half doing is just like writing the word architecture in this unbound book, um, many, many different ways. Um, this is even handwritten. Uh, and then, yeah. So it's it just like, that's sort of the form. And then what I would try to do is actually phonetically recreate, you know, like, how would you say that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I did that uh, to uh, a full gallery uh, in Winnipeg as part of a larger um, project that Ace Art was uh, hosting at the time. And, um, you know, the gallery was totally silent. I had no idea if people loved it or hated it. I think they're just astonished that I would do it. Um, and then after, um, you know, I don't know how long it lasted, five minutes or something like that. And, you know, my, my then partner's father looked at me and he said, oh, well, I guess you can't win them all. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so that's architecture. I continue to work with um, Jean's uh, memory. I'm, I'm right now writing a long essay about his life um, using the sort of uh, failed uh, sketch for a proposal for a mon mon monument to homophobic violence uh, in Winnipeg that, um, or pardon me, a monument to the victims of homophobic violence um, that has never actually come to fruition. So um, I feel like that was like a very long overview of Azure Translate Press, but you know, it's 20 years squished into, um, I don't know, 20 minutes, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kagan. That was really um, just loved hearing about all of the different ways and methods that you're working and also how open ended the press is like that you really are allowing the project to lead you. And it seems to um, and the collaboration that you're that you're working with with the different um, uh, gallerists and you know that you have all kinds of ways of working together, but also you know that you hearken back to things that are conceptual projects but also like the miniature books that the Monte, the Bronte sisters would have done you know right. that whole tradition, right it's quite a neat Victorian tradition as well like it's and and also on the west coast we have as we saw in the last project that we had the poets have always preceded carried by Lee Plested we could see Robin Glazer's influence here and the conceptual practices of writers here so it's really interesting to see how many of those expressions you touch on in the way that you're working. Um, and then of course, to Gary's work, <laughs> yeah. you know, watching that, I can just see how naturally that you would have been drawn to that work. And even the, the, um, the, the project that you did, um, the never ending horizon mm -hmm. project that you did you know, that looks like a kind of narrative, you know, they, they, they really, they do um, both open up and um, kind of destroy the idea of narrative, destroy mm -hmm. the idea of the art historical and how things should be seen or witnessed or understood, both in collections and archives. So you've really drawn on the archive there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's really interesting to see it go across your curatorial practice too. Um, so just thank you. And I'm, I hope, I can imagine that the audience that's listening today 
that was such a wonderful introduction to that work too because you don't have a platform because you don't have a website so right <laughs> you talked about that today it gave us that that history um so i'm wondering now that if we could talk about gary and your you know today is a virtual book launch and we do have the books here on site which i'm so excited about so hold them up together yeah. <laughs> in the gallery this is not the gallery obviously this is i'm in the residency of the gallery but um you can find them here at the gallery um so just to tell us a little bit about you know your first work with gary because i know you've done a number of projects with him yeah. um and also this project so Sure. Maybe a little bit of a briefer overview and we'll focus more on the book, but um, okay. sort of some key projects, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, like I had to kind of go back into my uh, memory and then of course uh, find, you know, slides or whatever camera photos, uh, camera, uh, phone camera pictures or whatever of time with Gary. Anyhow, uh, so we first met uh, in Winnipeg. I was working with uh, his wife, uh, Kathy Busby. So, you know, I always uh, am remiss to refer to a woman <laughs> in terms of the man that she might be married to. So I actually knew Kathy as an artist first and foremost, we met through our mutual friend, Robin Metcalf. And uh, I invited Kathy to do a project at Platform in Winnipeg. And lo and behold, she showed up with Gary Neal Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, I didn't, I didn't even know they were married. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm here to show Kathy's work. Anyway, Gary and I hit it off. Um, again, that was 2011. It was, just happened to be serendipitous. I was working on that never ending landscape project at the time. Shortly thereafter, uh, I had invited Gary to show his uh, photo works at Platform. So Platform, if you're not familiar, is a center for photographic and digital arts in Winnipeg. So obviously a photo mandate. And I, like most people thought about Gary as someone that was obviously very engaged with conceptual work, but predominantly as a painter and of course some of the institutional critique. But uh, I didn't really know that he had been producing this huge amount of photography projects over the, like since 1969, essentially. So um, luckily the curator Nis Kimbo, uh, working in Moncton had put together, she had done all the heavy lifting and assembled with Gary, a really nice survey of his photographic work and then just packaged it for us to take to platform. Uh, and so at that time I was leaving platform um, after four or five years of being the director curator there. And then, uh, but I, I also opened up a new space in Winnipeg called Window. And so I thought, oh, it'd be kind of nice to invite Gary to do a project with Window while his show was on at platform. And so what Gary offered is this piece called uh, God. Uh, and it's so great actually, because um, it's one of a, like a trilogy that he had worked on over a number of like decades. Um, and so and it kind of, and this is the, the Center for Contemporary Canadian Arts website that lists the project details as part of the uh, Winnipeg effect that I had mentioned. Um, and so the other two pieces in, uh, as in this trilogy are Uh-huh, uh, and which is produced as a silk screen and then uh, and a wall painting. Uh, and then the word new. And so, uh-huh, new, and God, according to Gary and his uh, infinite research, are the three most used words in the English language. And so, um, you know, uh, typical too of working with Gary is we ended up producing a piece of printed matter. And I think that's the next slide. Um, oh, so that's, a uh, oh, sorry, that's window uh, in Winnipeg. So it's a six foot by six foot street level window in an old heritage, uh, uh, warehouse that's converted to what is now the art space building and has been since the 80s. Uh, so we also sort of tongue in cheekly refer to it as Winnipeg's only 24 hour artist run center because uh, it's just a window. So it's always open or at least you can always view something in it. Uh, and so then the printed matter is, uh, yeah, one of his standard uh, leaflets or pamphlets. It's a little longer than usual, actually. Usually he really likes a square format, but then when you open it up, uh, it's a reproduction of the piece and that is a square. So that kind of makes sense. Um, so that was my second time working with Gary. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, I did this project called Since Then and I invited him to be part of it. And it's, uh, we showed his really uh, dynamic and, and crushing work, the colors of Canadian citizen Maha Harar, uh, where uh, Gary working with an interview that Maha Harar, 
uh, had given, I think, the Globe and Mail or, or you know, some other major press outlet. Uh, he had described his time as being a detainee uh, and the abuse he suffered, uh, you know, at the hands of his uh, captors. And so uh, what Gary did was he actually distilled the, com the conversation or the interview with Maharar uh, into these colors that he had described. And so it's the, you know, this really bright orange was the jumpsuit that he had to wear as a prisoner. The blue and the red were the results of his beatings. The black was uh, representative of the cable with which he was tied down and, and beaten. Um, so if you scroll around, around um, yeah, this is a hundred foot long uh, in wall painting at, at the Kamloops Art Gallery in 2017. And uh, on each piece of a colored band, uh, Gary put a new silk screen that he had made that says an eye for an eye. And it's, I think you're showing it right now, Lisa, right? Those silk screens uh, as part of the Griffin show. Um, so uh, this, I don't know if this was the first time he had shown them, but it was definitely the first time he had shown them with the big bands of color. And that kind of color on color thing is a real GNK uh, staple too. Uh, and then uh, as part of that project, I worked with the uh, CB2, which is the Canadian Journal for Literary Criticism. And we did a sort of artist pages uh, and gave Gary a two page spread of the color bands. Uh, so that's sort of how that was presented. Um, and in that uh, folio, I, again, I don't offer a curatorial overview, but what I do is I use the artworks to tell the story of uh, two women who had long been in love and were kind of, um, uh, one was on her deathbed uh, and they're talking about what it is to survive. Um, and, you know, things about like the dirt under their fingernails and things like that. Okay, uh, and then in uh, 2018, I commissioned a reworking of Gary's Corrections piece. So Corrections was initially done at the Anna Leah Lowens Gallery in Halifax at NASCAD. I think actually probably one of, for my money, one of the best pieces Gary's ever done. Uh, and, it, and it's using the inherited structure of the street, uh, uh, like the city workers that have to uh, indicate on the street what needs to be brought up or fixed up. So the blue is always like indicating a water line. The uh, green would be maybe electrical or orange is electrical. Anyway, so he had this sort of set parameter of colors that he could work with. And he would just impose that on a very old structure that usually houses uh, an art center. So for example, the gallery at NASCAD, which of course he'll always be uh, extricably linked to. Um, and he would highlight all the problems with the physical infrastructure of the space. I think it's just so brilliant. You know, it's really, uh, and it's extremely eye-catching. You know, you walk past it and uh, you have to stop and wonder what happened. Uh, but it's somehow so familiar because we all exist in these cities where we see this kind of spray paint on the street all the time. And so, you know, whenever I'm walking around and I see that spray paint on the sidewalk, I always think of Gary. Um, Okay, and then uh, later that same year, um, Gary was doing a residency at the Vancouver uh, artist run space called CSA um, in, in Mount Pleasant. And for that, he was trying to remember all the names of the people he had ever met, which you know is an amazing idea. And it was an idea that he had first started in different ways in the 60s with his, um, you know, uh, he'd do a stint, uh, say, at Cal Arts, uh, teaching there, and then do a performance at the end, trying to remember all the names of the people he met in his uh, small uh, residency. Um, and so with, uh, with the 2018 CSA installation, what Gary was doing was actually confronting his new reality of living with dementia. And that, you know, added um, difficulty in trying to remember names. Um, and so I thought it was extremely brave work and what had happened was there was a number of uh, sort of studio assistants or facilitators that would go and sit with Gary one at a time. You know, Jonathan Middleton was one of them, Hank Bull, myself. Um, there's a few, uh, David McMillian, of course. Um, there's a few other uh, that I didn't get to meet. Um, anyway, and so Gary ended up drawing um, or producing this list of names. Uh, and, you know, some days were really clear and you could write very clearly and in a straight line. Other days, not so much. Um, but it was an amazing thing to witness and uh, just to be with him at that point. Um, and uh, I remember, um, I think it was maybe the second day. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Gary turned uh, to me and, you know, with a bright eye and said, well, your name should be on the wall. And I said, 
okay, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> and and he's, but I had to help him spell it because, you know, my name is difficult to spell for most people <laughs> functioning like, you know, at all cylinders. So anyway, um, so that was uh, a really important uh, point of, of working with Gary. And I'd written actually a long response to this project that I was hoping to have published, but no one ever wanted to pick it up. So <laughs> uh, this is more about me than him, I think. Um, and then uh, just earlier uh, this season, I facilitated the, uh, again, the sort of uh, revisiting of a larger work that he had done called The Big Five. And The Big Five is a critique of the five largest uh, financial institutions in Canada. And what he's done is we might, you know, very clearly um, witness is, or, or uh, comprehend is he's just inverted all the logos, uh, the colors of all the logos. So, you know, the gold and, um, uh, red of CIBC becomes the yellow and blue of another bank that I don't work with. Uh, you know, we all have like our own affiliates that we can kind of you know use this to to spring into action with. So, so um, at the Arts Council where I work, we have a very small present um, exhibition or a project space. Pardon me. We have a large gallery, and then within that gallery, there's a small project space that we call the vault because it actually has a big heavy vault door. And so I thought, oh well, it'd be kind of you know interesting to see the big five smashed into one vault and it becomes like an immersive installation. Um, so that's over the nine, last nine years, um, eight projects <laughs> with GNK. And then um, to celebrate Gary's show at uh, the now Bolton show that David McLoyan put together uh, as well as um, uh, Gary's 85th birthday, uh, as we try and sleep press organized uh, this project called 18 Drawings. And so, uh, as we mentioned, um, with Gary's uh, living now living with dementia, part of his art practice um, had to shift very drastically. And so even though he's still able to uh, more or less facilitate larger installations like the Big Five and things like that, it, with, you know, an incredible amount of help from Kathy Busby, um, what he can do on his own are these drawings. And so these drawings, the, the book is life size uh, and all the drawings were photographed by Rachel Topham. And what we've done, this was sort of, uh, as an editor, I insisted that we photograph not just the front of the drawing, but also um, the back of the drawing. And so the way it's presented, like I think you'd have to be very sensitive to understand this, but because it just looks like one page um, you could see through it, but in fact, it's actually two photographs of the same artwork. And um, the reason I wanted to do that is because um, not always, but sometimes there is a lot of information <laughs> that, that is accrued uh, through the backs of those drawings. Um, like this is a very good one. So this is the back of that drawing. So they actually you know, look like two totally different things. Anyway, um, and then uh, it's printed full color, even though they are black and white drawings um, or drawings with black ink. Um, but it, it did that in, as a way to, um, to honor the nuance of the mark making. And then uh, finally, um, Kathy Busby and Gary Neil Kennedy offer a very small um, text about how the drawings were made. And it's very, um, you know, it's, it's not overly academic or anything like that. It's just very matter of fact. And, uh, from what I understand, uh, being friends with Kathy, friends with both of them, but being, you know, chatting more with Kathy these days is um, these small recollection pieces are actually uh, building into more of a part of their practice together. So they offered a very similar recollection to uh, an anniversary catalog for Danielle Buren, talking about Danielle's um, visiting Halifax and the lobster dinner that Gary helped organize and things like that. Um, so it's just like these small letters of memory. Um, and so this now is part of that ongoing project, I believe. Um, and then um, I should say, uh, so I mentioned that everything we do is a very limited edition. So this is an edition of only 50 um, and they're $50 a piece and they're available at Griffin Art Projects. Um, and the, the full cast really that helped assemble this book, it's um, obviously Gary as the artist, um, Kathy Busby as the facilitator, myself as the editor, uh, Rachel Toppin photography, as I mentioned, and then my good friend, Linda Gammon, who helped uh, throw in way too many hours doing the layout of this book in a software that I just don't have. <laughs> so I really did appreciate Linda's help on this book. And, um, and it, I think it really shows just uh, how much uh, dedication uh, it 
you know, it takes to, to do even something that's modest like this. Yeah. So that's, um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> that's all the prepared notes. That's wonderful. It's really helpful. And I love the way that you paid that attention to the other side of the drawing because so much of it, um, the intensity of that other side, I just, I really love the, you know, the, when the sheet breaks open and, you know, there's tearing kind yeah. of evidence and things like that. And um, we do have um, some of the drawings in the exhibition as well. So it's right. great. Yeah, but you can only see them on the front side there. <laughs> Not until 5 p.m. today, those of you that are listening, <laughs> to come down. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, we will have these on, on site. So you can email us too at Griffin Art Projects to order, the, order one of them if you'd like. And because there's no website, is there any other way that uh, anyone can? Uh, yeah, I'm in talks with Art Metropole now, but getting them um, over there. So I usually s reserve, you know, um, a handful of uh, from each project for either Art Metropole or Printed Matter in New York, um, or you know, or Gallery in Vancouver. But with uh, Griffin Art Projects having them already in Vancouver, it's that's fine. <laughs> so yeah, again, because there's so few available that it's we have to be choosy of where they go sometimes. And we're so lucky because Gary actually signed them. Too. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Yeah, so that's actually amazing because honestly, um, we were talking about what what to price this at. And when you look at the other artist books that are still available, because, you know, they tend to be in the hundreds of dollars. So uh, to have a brand new one that is um, autographed by him or signed by him uh, for just 50 bucks. Wow. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Kagan. That has been so informative and also to place this project within the context of all of the different ways that you've been contributing to artist books. So congratulations yeah. on all that hard work. I know oh, thank you, it made so. it sound easy, but uh, <laughs> you coordinate all of that and, with, and to be open enough to think of it conceptually newly each time, which is such a rich way to draw on Gary's tradition through his printed matter and the contribution that he's made over his lifetime in thinking conceptually about text. So it's it's such a beautiful honor to him that you've done yeah. this book. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. He is, um, like I said, one of my favorite artists working in Canada right now and his contributions. I think David has done an amazing job, not only with Now Bulletin, but his previous, you know, criticism, uh, published criticisms, but also the help he did with the last art college publication, like all these things, um, you know, David is a huge champion of Gary's practice. And uh, it, yeah, I'm just so happy to be in concert with all the people involved. Yes, thanks to thanks to David and the selection. We have about 80% of the work um, from the collection that's in the exhibition. So it's the broadest um, exhibition wow. collection that David has pulled together. And it was no small feat to look at all <laughs> that work and and decide on how the collection could be represented. So you, we have the archive and um, the correspondences as well as um, Gary's own work and the works of other colleagues and friends. So again, very, very layered. This is my small nod to Now Bulletin. I've got um, Gary's uh, posted piece that um, if you're not familiar, it's very funny. Um, mail art project he did uh, talking about no hunting, no fishing on Dia Beacon grounds. Um, and the late Cliffy Lynn gave this to me. Uh, so, you know, very happy to have that. And then of course, uh, the unmistakable Lauren Sweener uh, behind me. <laughs> so the two of these, you know, on my shoulder, like the good and bad devils. I don't know. <laughs> Perfect pair. Yeah. And we have a number of, of the Larry Wiener works in the exhibition too, so. Right, yes. Great. Thank you so much, Kagan. It's really been a, a pleasure and an honor. It's so funny, you know, to think about something that I started in my parents' basement 20 years ago. And then now it's like, oh, I have like 30 projects to talk about, but, you know, try and squeeze that all into an hour <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'll just say it's, it's been a, a lot of fun. So thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Jazz. And um, I'll just keep thanking David and of course, Gary and Kathy. So, yeah. Wonderful. I'm just going to jump on here to say my thanks as well. Thanks so much, Kagan and Lisa and for everyone that attended tonight and for all the wonderful questions. Um, this has been such a pleasure to listen to and such a great way to end the current exhibition, which has been just so wonderful to see it unfold with all these uh, presentations alongside it. So thank you to everyone and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday.
<laughs> Great. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>